your political expert for the night. I'm joined in studio with our anchors Kayla Brown and Zoe Mowry. of Breeze TV. Live from the Allison B. Park. Live from the Allison B. Parker studio in the School of Media Arts and Design at James Madison University, this is Breeze TV. Sorry for all of the technical difficulties. Things are pretty hectic here like they are around the entire country. Welcome to the 2022 Breeze TV election show. I'm Kayla Brown. And I'm Zoe Mowry. Tonight, we'll be providing first-hand coverage of the 6th District House, Harrisonburg City Council, and Harrisonburg School Board races. We will also be covering updates on the Virginia 2nd and 7th District, as well as the Georgia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and New Hampshire Senate races, as well as the Georgia gubernatorial election. Voting has not always been a right guaranteed to all Americans, but now Election Day serves as a monumental moment for all of us to make our voices heard. Although local elections may not receive as much attention, we spoke to members of our community about the importance of expressing our right to vote, every opportunity that we are given. It's really important to vote, especially for college students, because college students represent a very large percentage of the population that isn't voting at a rate that they should be. Because a lot of people our age are like, eh, you know, whatever, it doesn't really matter. But I think it does matter to kind of like get your thoughts out there and make a difference. It's important for young people to vote so we can get our views across, especially for, I mean, younger people like us. We're the majority in the vote. This is where Harrisonburg and JMU thrive is the fact that they make decisions for us. They make decisions on a local level for us. I think we all see a lot of issues that we have concerns about. Because I'm not happy with everything that's going on in this country. And realistically, the only thing I can do is vote. There's a plethora of reasons why everyone should vote. For me, I vote because I want to keep my leaders accountable. I vote because I want to keep my personal views intact as well. I think it's extremely important to vote in local elections because these are the decision makers that most influence our daily lives. A lot of people think that local elections, specifically the midterm elections, aren't as important as um, federal elections, more specifically the general election. Um, and this simply just isn't true. There's still issues that come down to the local level. I mean, we're all living here. So everything that happens here in Harrisonburg is still going to affect us. Things like school board, city council, etc. You know, you see how that changes things when you live in a place. The smaller the election, it adds up globally. I mean, because if certain areas are blue or red, the more of an impact it will be later on in different elections. I just want to vote and make sure my voice is heard in the way that I can. We are going to change this world somehow. We got to change it with voting. Despite JMU being among some of the top colleges for voter turnout in the United States, civic engagement among students still remains low. The Institute for Democracy and Higher Education at Tufts University reported that 33.3% of JMU students voted in the 2018 primary election. That's 300% higher than the 2014 midterms, where only 8.8 .8 participated. Our political expert, Regine Aranazari, is in studio with more information about tonight's races. What do you have for us, Regine? Thanks, Kayla and Zoe. Tonight, we will be providing live election results directly from the voting registrar for the 6th Congressional District, Harrisonburg City Council, and Harrisonburg School Board. For the 6th District, we have Democrat Jennifer Lewis running against incumbent Ben Klein. Klein has represented the district since 2018. There are also two seats open for Harrisonburg City Council. Monica Robinson, Danny Fleming, Marshall Rennick, and Rick Nagel are all vying for those spots. Additionally, Democrat Chris Jones is running unopposed in a special election for City Council following the resignation of George Hirschman. Harrisonburg School Board has three seats up for grabs. Newcomer Emma Phillips and career members Andy Cohen and Kristen Laughlin are running together against Corin Jackson and incumbent Obie Hill. While Breeze TV has been closely following Harrisonburg's local elections, let's take a look at what is at stake at the national level. Democrats are scrambling to retain congressional control as they brace for potential losses in battleground House races and rely on razor-thin margins in key Senate matches. 
Republicans have consistently been favored to win House control and only need five seats to win a majority. Democrats hold the slimmest possible majority in the Senate and Republicans need only one more seat to control the chamber. Before we dive deeper into the key races, I would like to introduce our analysis panel. We are joined by JMU political science professor, Dr. Valerie Solfaro, whom I have the pleasure to work with in the political science department. Thank you for joining us on such an important night. So my first question for you is, every single House seat, as well as 36 Senate seats, are on the ballot tonight. What races are you most interested in watching tonight? Obviously, I'm interested in the Virginia race, races, but I'm also interested in several Senate seats, in particular, the ones that look like they're going to be close, like potentially Utah or Arizona, um, Wisconsin, Ohio, Georgia, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and New Hampshire. About these races that you're listing? Those are the races where there's a possibility of either the Democrats or Republicans winning those races. And what's unique about Utah is it's a Republican versus an independent, um, and there's no Democrat in the race. So again, they all have the potential to change the outcome in the Senate in terms of the overall vote count. Mm -hmm. And obviously, presidential elections bring out higher turnout in which. And, um, but which voters in particular are most motivated to participate in this year's midterms? Usually in a midterm, we see voters that are older, that are whiter, and that are wealthier than the presidential election electorate. Um, the most recent midterms that we saw actually had an unusually high midterm turnout. It was the highest previously since World War II. And so one of the things we'll be wondering this year is if that trend is going to follow on the pattern of the previous midterms. Since the Supreme Court's decision of overturning Roe v. Wade this summer, we've also had unusual numbers of voter registrations in some states, and in particular, registrations of young people and women. And so we might expect more voter turnout among those groups as well, compared to what we would see in a normal election. Thank you so much for your input. We'll be back with more analysis on tonight's election. Until then, Zoe and Kayla have more information on our local elections. Thanks, Regine. While many voters headed to the polls today, an estimated 35.5 million Americans casted their votes early this election season. Midterm participation reached a 40-year high into 2018, and early voting numbers for this election suggest that turnout could be even higher this year. Our politics team took a dive into how early voting in Harrisonburg was going last week. The COVID pandemic. Early voting has become a more accessible option for some Americans, with an increasing number of voters casting their ballots before Election Day. So to compare it to the last midterm election, which would have been 2018, 997 people in 2018 voted in early in that whole election. And as of yesterday evening, 2,594 people have voted early in Harrisonburg. Despite this progress, civic engagement among students remains low. Well, I can say that uh, for JMU specifically, registrations have been down compared to last year's. Roughly 40% of Harrisonburg City voters participate in last year's election. Voting officials predict that number to be slightly lower this year. We assumed that city turnout would be around 40%. Um, uh, but, you know, those numbers can always change. Uh, but that was our assumption, and that's including everything on Election Day, early voting, and mail-in ballot. Voter turnout in the United States still falls short in comparison to other developed. Since the COVID pandemic, early voting has become a more accessible option for some Americans, with an increasing number of voters casting their ballots before Election Day. So to compare it to the last midterm election, which would have been 2018, 997 people in 2018 voted in early in that whole election. And as of yesterday evening, 2,594 people have voted early in Harrisonburg. Despite this progress, civic engagement among students remains low. Well, I can say that uh, for JMU specifically, registrations have been down compared to last year's. Roughly 40% of Harrisonburg City voters participate in last year's election. Voting officials predict that number to be slightly lower this year. We assumed that city turnout would be around 40%. Um, uh, but, you know, those. 
Although the age, 18 to 24 demographic, made the largest jump in turnout in 2018 and 2020, college students are still less likely to participate in non-presidential elections. Our reporter, Alexa Bonilla, quizzed JMU students on their voting behaviors and their knowledge of this year's election. On campus, asking students if they're registered to vote and finding out what they know about local elections. Are you registered to vote? Uh, no, I am not. I registered to vote, um... Three weeks ago, I think? I am not, no. I am not. I just turned 18 a couple months ago. <laughs> Given how the past couple elections have gone to the candidates, I don't really feel any big motivation to register to vote for a candidate I don't really believe in. Are you registered to vote in Harrisonburg or your hometown? I'm registered to vote in my hometown. How do you plan on voting? Um, I guess by absentee ballot, probably. Do you know who the candidates are? <sighs> um. Not right now. I need to get on that. <laughs> Is it Bill Klein and that woman? Why are local elections important? Well, not only do they affect us directly, um, but you know, especially you know, a community like JMU and college towns like that, there are so many of us that we don't even know how directly will be impacted by these candidates and what their policies are. I definitely do think that they're important, but the way that the American like voting system is set up in the media, um, what's it called? The media like kind of portrays it. I feel like they don't get nearly enough of the attention and coverage that they do. Like I kind of forget about them most of the time and I think a lot of other people tend to as well. So will you register to vote? Maybe I will now. <laughs> I will. You know what? I'll do it today. Yes. You just reminded me. Thank you. Reporting for Breeze TV, I'm Alexa Bonilla. We would now like to highlight our first candidate on Harrisonburg's ballot. Democrat Jennifer Lewis. Lewis previously ran against Ben Klein in 2018, but was only able to attain 40% of the vote. Still, Lewis is determined she can win the majority here in the 6th District. For Jennifer Lewis, the drive to make change in the world started at a young age when her and a friend decided to create an environmental club in elementary school. And that really just made me kind of want to be involved in, in these kind of things. And then as I kind of grew and became older and knew more about um, different top topics and issues, I became more interested in, in being a solution, part of the solution to so many of the problems that we face in our world. A big part of her inspiration comes from her aunt, who was a mayor in a nearby town growing up. It was this that sparked her interest to run for office when she got older. One of the best things that she advised was to never listen to the naysayers, never listen to the people that tell you that a woman can't do these things, and you just got to keep plowing forward. Lewis is running for the second time in the 6th District and hopes to be in their first ever woman representative. I lead with my heart. I'm very empathetic. I'm a mental health worker by trade, so um, I tend to be a pretty good listener, I hope. <laughs> uh, most would agree with that. And I'm willing to compromise. Some of the issues Lewis believes include the legalization of marijuana, women's rights, and criminal justice reform. And I think that I will bring um, you know, active listening and empathy um, to D.C., which is surely lacking right now. For Lewis, politics aside, there's one message she has for the community. So I just encourage folks to be active and engaged voters. This is Joshua Dixon reporting for Breeze TV. Our reporter Noelle James is live at the Democratic Watch Party with more updates. How are things looking over there, Noelle? We would now like to highlight our next candidate, Republican Ben Klein. Klein currently serves as a member of the House Committee on Appropriations and the House Committee on the Budget, and has made his case as to how he will continue to represent the 6th District. Incumbent Ben Klein is running for another term in the 6th Congressional District. He is facing off against Jennifer Lewis, the same opponent he faced in 2018. Klein defeated Lewis 59% to 40%. His main goal is to combat inflation. Uh, we were energy independent before. We, if we increase domestic production, we can immediately uh, affect the price of oil, and that will help uh, folks. Klein also believes the representatives have to be the voice for all voters even if they do not agree with each other. You know, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. We're supposed to listen twice as much as we speak. So I do a lot of listening, and I try and uh, take all of my constituents' opinions into account. Now, I disagree with some of my constituents on some issues. But you just try and do the best you can, listen, and represent uh, their views as best you can. And Klein has one final message. On November 8th, 
we are going to win the majority in the House and Senate and set this nation on the right path once again. Reporting for Breeze TV, I'm Zoe Mowry. We're now going to try and send it back over to Noelle James, who's live with the Democratic Watch Party. How's things looking over there, Noelle? Thanks so much, Kayla. Um, I'm live at Clementine's where I'm going to get comments from Miss Emma Phillips, who was one of the candidates on the uh, school board election. So um, thank you so much. Uh, so how do you feel about uh, turnout today? What is your general feeling about the whole elections? I, it felt really good. I really enjoyed speaking with people. Everyone I spoke to was... Um, for the most part, supportive, and if not supportive, at least really kind. So I had some really good conversations and connected with some of the Harrisonburg public. I'm Perfect. And what, do you, what can you say about the turnout today? Do you feel good about it? Do you feel like, you know, it was more than what you expected or what? So I'm a newcomer to this, and I wasn't exactly sure what to expect, but everyone tells me that the numbers were really good, and that sort of is the feeling that I got from being out there in front of our schools. So. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much for your comments. Join us. We'll be coming back to speak with more candidates on their elections and how they feel about everything. It's going to be back to you guys in studio, Kayla and Zoe. Our reporter, Colby Reese, is currently at the Republican Watch Party at El Charo. What's going on over there, Colby? Thank you. I'm joined by Juliana McGrath, who is the campaign manager for Marshall Rennick here at the Republican watch party. Can you just tell me what events like this on election day mean to the uh, parties that are bringing them together? Well, you know, this is what we look forward to on election day. It's just a time to gather together after a long 13 hours of working the polls and just talk about our experiences throughout the day, kind of recap what we saw from voters in the city, you know, talk about what we can do better for next year and just talk about how excited we are for the future, win or lose, just come together and be excited for the things that we've seen and the things that we want to do better. And what do you believe that the Republican candidates on the ballot can bring to key issues in the area? So uh, the candidate that I worked for this year, Marshall Rennick, was uh, he was an independent candidate who was endorsed by the Republican Party. And I think our main goal this year, should he win, is to unite the city council and kind of shy away from this one party rule that the Harrisonburg City Council has now and take one-sided politics and just politics in general out of city council and focus on specifically the city of Harrisonburg. And we spent a lot of time talking to voters and knocking on doors and visiting events and seeing, you know, what they really, really care about. And, you know, we want to focus on the little things, the things that might go unnoticed, the things that people might find small. And we want to focus on those because, you know, when something has a firm foundation, it's strong all the way up. And that is our goal for Harrisonburg this year. Well, thank you so much for joining me, and back to the studio. You know, Zoe, I think that's really interesting because Marshall Rennick is running as an independent, but he's endorsed by the College of Republicans. But Rick Nagel, who is also an independent, is not. Yeah, and Marshall is over at the Republican Watch Party, so two and two. Well, things are shaping up on this election night. And in other news, Regine has more information for us on two battleground races here in the Commonwealth. Regine? Thanks, Zoe. Some Virginia voters could see new names on the ballot this year after the Virginia Su Supreme Court unanimously approved a new redistricting map following the 2020 census. One of the most notable changes was the redrawing of Salem into our 6th district rather than the 9th. Our politics team highlighted the changes of or, and potential benefits of redistricting when the new map was released. Students have the opportunity to redraw their districting maps in a once-in-a-decade process following the United States Census. In a referendum last year, Virginia voters created a bipartisan redistricting commission to overlook the process. However, the decision was later turned over to the Virginia Supreme Court after the commission was unable to reach a consensus. Although the commission was deadlocked, JME political science professor Dr. Marty Cohen discussed the benefits of bipartisan commissions compared to state legislature oversight. You know, the steps that were taken to try to make this a more uh, transparent process, to make it a less partisan process. And really, you know, redistricting is sometimes Republican versus Democrat, but sometimes it's also incumbent versus everyone else. And sometimes the incumbents from both parties get together and just see how they can make their own seats even safer. JMU graduate assistant Angelina Clapp spent the last year working on a redistricting project regarding communities of interest, particularly university students, and potential issues they could face with map redrawing.
Claps described the role of public opinion in the commission's deliberations. A lot of people also don't know that in Virginia, just specifically, you do have a say and you can use your voice in the process. There's a very um, transparent way that they do it where you can submit public testimony. You can even draw your own map and submit it to the commission. The court appointed two special masters, one nominated by Democrats and the other by Republicans, to draw the new map, which now gives Democrats a 6-5 to five advantage compared to their previous 7-4 to four edge. Dr. Cohen elaborated on the strengths of the districting reforms. It's better in terms of some of the metrics that are used to determine, you know, whether there's bias or, you know, partisan skew in, in a map. You know, the, the amount of wasted votes is less. Um, the, um, the, median, the, the median district is closer to the state median. Reporting for Breeze TV, I'm Regine Aranazari. So before we move on any further, it appears our reporter Sam Game has some results coming in. What do you have for us, Sam? Thanks, Regine. Polls closed at polls closed at 7 p.m. this evening. Thanks, Regine. Polls closed at 7 p.m. this evening. By 6 p.m., 9,600 people have voted in the city of Harrisonburg. That is a stark decrease from the nearly 14,000 that voted in 2018. What this means for city council and school board, we will just have to find out. We'll keep you posted. Back to you guys in the studio. So the new redistricting map has made Virginia's 7th district a key race in this year's midterms. Incumbent Abigail Sebamberger is a centrist Democrat faced off against former police officer Republican Yesley Vega. And just two weeks before today, this race transitioned from a Democratic lean to a toss-up. So um, the new redistricting map uh, moved the 7th district for further into northern Virginia, a more liberal-leaning region. Uh, how and why would this negatively affect Spanberger? Well, it negatively affects Spanberger if the parts of Richmond that she lost, which is almost all of it or all of it, um, aren't entirely made up by the parts of Prince William and Fredericksburg and Albemarle that she gets in exchange, right? So I think that ultimately she lost a more, a more liberal area and didn't gain enough liberal territory is, is the thought in that race. And so it's become a little bit more marginal. Um, Although I will add that prior to that, it was a district that was also won by conservatives as well. Mm -hmm. And um, Virginia's second district race between Democrat incumbent Elaine Luria and a Republican state senator, uh, Jen Kiggins, has become another battleground to decide House control. Both Luria and Spanberger flipped their districts blue in 2018, and both races are coming are among the country's most expensive campaigns. So how much influence does fundraising um, effect like in election and is it enough to secure a victory? Fundraising can have an effect if candidates need fundraising to close the gap and so the numbers I saw on that race in particular were by this point that nine, um, 13 million dollars in outside money has been spent, that Luria has raised just under 10 million and Kiggins has raised just under 3 million and so that's a big difference between the candidates but if we look back to the last presidential election year the Republican Senate candidate in South Carolina was vastly outspent by the Democrat, and it didn't matter, right? The Democrats still lost. So fundraising can't overcome a partisan vote disadvantage in a district. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your insight. Um, our reporter Sam Game has an update on both of these races. What do you have for us, Sam? Well, we are still waiting on an update from the 7th District race um, that we were just talking about. Um, it is a very interesting race because the redistricting has happened in that area, so we will just have to keep you guys posted, but back to you guys in the studio. Thanks, Sam. Now we'll turn our attention to the rest of the country, starting out in Georgia, where a lot is on the line. For the gubernatorial election between incumbent Brian Kemp and Casey, Stacey Abrams and the Senate race between incumbent Raphael Warnick and Herschel Walker, polls are showing a close race. Voter turnout could determine how Georgia progresses forward. We'll now turn our, to our political expert and panel for what's at stake in these elections. So last year, Georgia made numerous changes to their voting laws, including limiting the number of ballot drop-off boxes and imposing new voter ID requirements. Do you think this will have any impact on tonight's results? 
I don't think those are going to be the things that likely affect voter turnout in Georgia. I think it's just that Democrats generally perform less well in the midterms because their normal constituency is a constituency that's younger and that's less affluent. And so generally midterms tend to advantage Republican candidates. And so to me, the question is whether or not Democrats are going to be able to not only overcome maybe some of the mobilization barriers and the, the legal obstacles, but whether or not Democrats find those candidates credible enough, whether Republican voters are still energized by the last election, and in particular in the aftermath of the 2020 election, whether enough Republicans in Georgia feel like Georgia is suddenly important that they need to turn out to vote now. And I want to turn our election to the Georgia gubernatorial race. So Stacey Abrams, she previously ran against Brian Kemp in 2018. What do you think is different about her campaign this year? Um, I don't think her campaign is all that different this year. I think what's different is Brian Kemp's campaign, that, that if you recall 2020, he supported some of the recounts. He didn't support claiming that President Trump um, did not win Georgia. And so he was, he was a contested candidate this time in the Republican primary. And so one of the things I think we want to know this time is whether Republican voters are, are less happy with Brian Kemp on the ballot, whether they like Herschel Walker, but they're less supportive of Brian Kemp. And so I'm not sure if that benefits Stacey Abrams in any way or not. Um, I'm not sure how much I see a difference between her in 2018 or 2020. Mm -hmm. And the Georgia Senate special election in 2020 went to a runoff. So do you see this happening again tonight? And if so, what do you expect? Yeah, I see it could easily happen in, in this election as well. And if it does, then potentially the same thing that happens in all runoffs, which is fewer people often vote in the runoff. Um, and so again, if the runoff is in December or January, there might be diminished voter interest by then. Thank you so much for your insight. Our reporter Sam Game has more updates on our local elections. Sam? Thanks. We still have three precincts that we are waiting on uh, to be reported, but from early voting and early precincts, we have found that Emma Phillips, Kristen Laughlin, and Andy Cohen are in the lead for school board. They are running together um, with similar opinions in their party, so we will keep you guys posted. Back to you guys in the studio. So you can go first, Zoe. This is becoming so much, such an interesting race, Kayla. What do you think? I think the school board race, this is probably one of the most intense school board races that I've seen. There's a lot of tension and a lot of just disagreements on parents' rights and LGBTQ plus children in schools and what their safety looks like. Um, I know Corinne Jackson is very much for parents' rights as well as Obie Hill. Um, I know neither of those candidates have explicitly said they um, agreed with Youngkin's new transgender policy, um, but I also know um, that Emma, Kristen, and Andy are all very opposed to that. Um, and you were actually at the walkout that happened last week, correct? Yes, I was at the Harrisonburg High School walkout where students who were organized by the GSA club on in their school, they walked out against Youngkin's new model policy and against the lawsuit that Harrisonburg um, School Board is facing, which um, is a group of Harrisonburg teachers and um, parents that are gathered together by a law group out of Arizona. Or, um, and it's just, they say that this, the school should not have that amount of say in what a student cannot tell their parents. And the students at Harrisonburg High School said, we should be able to have these rights. And um, I know Andy Cohen and Kristen Laughlin were at the walkout, I spoke with Andy, and he said that he just wanted to support the students and their rights. Yeah, I know, it's just really interesting stuff. Now we'd like to toss it back over to our reporter, Noelle James, who was at the, oh, sorry, we'll be turning to our panel, Rougine. Um, sorry for those technical difficulties. We'll actually be tossing to Noel at the Democratic Watch Party. I can barely hear them. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. We're at Clementine's Cafe and the mood is ecstatic. Uh, people are in good moods and they're hopeful for whatever is going to happen. We're getting ready to speak to Andrew Cohen, who will be live in a few minutes. So for now, I'll be getting back to you guys in studio. So um, 
I would like to divert our um, attention to some other battleground uh, races. So no other election has uh, reached as much attention as the Pennsylvania Senate race, and it is Democrats' best opportunity to pick up a seat to save their slim majority in the Senate. Just two weeks before Election Day, Fetterman had a rocky debate performance against Oz. How much do you um, believe this will impact tonight's results? Yeah, I would say that for the Democrats, the stroke that Fetterman had during the campaign has not been the best thing for them, right? All other things being equal, absent the stroke, I think that he would have been a really strong candidate against Oz. But I think that it's hard to say that this doesn't hurt him. And even if he you know, makes a strong case that, that it's a disability and that it's temporary, nonetheless, um, it may still affect how people, is perceived, people perceive him. At the same time, I think he's popular in western parts of the state in areas like Butler County where, um, where Dr. Oz is going to be less popular. So it's not that I don't think he has a chance. I just think the chance has narrowed considerably between the debate performances and the health problems. Mm -hmm. And before we move on to cover like more of, about these races, Sam Game has another update on our elections. Sam? Um, actually, we're going to be tossing to our reporter Colby Reese at the Republican Watch Party. Colby? Thanks, Regine. I'm still here at El Tar, where there is a large turnout at the Republican Watch Party. There's still much anticipation as results are coming in, but we are still waiting on confirmation on who is winning these elections. The big one is obviously Ben Klein and Jennifer Lewis, and we will see if they will get to celebrate Ben Klein winning tonight. Back to you on the studio. All right, we're going to go back to our reporter Sam Game for some updates on our local elections. Sam? All right, so in in the second district, uh, Kagans is running, um, leading against um, Luria in the second district. Um, so those are the results that we've had in so far for that. Um, they are leading. Uh, one third of the precincts has reported. So we will get, we will keep you guys posted on that. In Georgia, uh, 25, 26 percent um, have reported. Polls closed at seven o'clock in Georgia today. So we're still waiting on results for the Senate race and the gubernatorial race in Georgia. Back to you guys in the studio. So our reporter Sam mentioned a little bit about um, the results coming in from Georgia. What can we expect from like just like these twenty five percent of votes coming in? Probably nothing um, in particular. Um, it depends on what counties they are. It depends on what those counties look like. So if they're not a random distribution of voters, it would be really tough to know. And do you think that what counties, like specific counties in Georgia, do you think we should be focusing on? I mean, the Democrats tend to do better in Fulton County and Cobb County. So the areas in and around the Georgia suburbs, basically, and the rural parts of Georgia are the parts that are going to be Republican, like a lot of other states. Um, and in some states, the urban counties count things efficiently, and in some cases, the volume of votes makes it more difficult for them to count them quickly. And do you think that it would be possible that uh, Georgia decides to have a split ticket this year? Yeah, I think it's entirely possible that, um, that people prefer one candidate for the Senate and another for the governor, and that could happen in Pennsylvania as well. Mm -hmm. And I now want to direct our uh, focus to Ohio. So Ohio Democrat Senate candidate Tim Ryan has chosen to distance himself from the Democratic establishment while Republican J.D. Vance has embraced um, um, the Republican establishment and, and like embraced Trumpism. Yeah. Uh, what do these tactics say about the Ohio race? Um, that President Trump is popular in Ohio, and thus Republican candidates feel like that's a safe thing to do, right? Whereas Republicans in Virginia feel like that's a little bit less of a safe strategy. So J.D. Vance has initially built his career on distancing himself from Donald Trump, and now he feels like Trump's strong performance in Ohio in the 2020 presidential election um, perhaps suggests that Trump is a popular figure in Ohio and that embracing Trump is you know, a net benefit for him as a candidate. Mm -hmm. And that seems to have been effective for him, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. And um, questioning the 2020 election has become a growing centerpiece of Republican campaigns. How effective has this approach been for the party? I think it's been a very effective approach. It's mobilized Republican voters. It gives people a reason to show up to vote at the midterms. Right? If you feel like somebody stole something from you, took something inappropriately in 2020, then it's a reason for you to try to get that back right? and take away control of the government that you lost. And the midterm is, is your first opportunity to do that. 
So New Hampshire Republican Senate candidate uh, Don Boldick has flip-flopped on whether on the legitimacy of the 2020 results. How could this approach work for a state like New Hampshire? In a state like New Hampshire, it could work. Um, potentially, I think the argument in, in the case of, of that particular candidate is that flip-flopping is, is more the problem of candidate quality than the position that he took. So um, taking a strong position either on Donald Trump's side or a strong position that he's independent from Donald Trump, probably either would have been effective in a state like New Hampshire that's very mm -hmm. libertarian. It's trying to take both positions maybe that's a little bit more damaging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to throw it back to our main desk for some uh, commentary on our local elections. Thanks, Virginia. We actually have breaking news. We're going to throw it over to our reporter, Sam Game, who's in the newsroom. What's it looking like, Sam? Thanks. So we have a city council update. Uh, Robinson and Danny Fleming, Monica Robinson and Danny Fleming, are both in the lead right now. They are ahead for the two seats that are up in city council right now. As for the 7th district, Vega is currently in the lead with Spanberger falling behind with 45 to 55. Um, and that's all we have. Back to you guys in the studio. Um, and so going back to um, you know what Sam just said about city council, um, yeah, I think it, it's been a really interesting race to watch. Sorry about that. Going back to our Georgia Senate race between Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock, um, you know, something that I see that even is like common with Pennsylvania, um, how people that have more status um, turn into politicians, and that's something we saw with Herschel Walker um, and Dr. Oz, which I think is really interesting. And Herschel Walker is currently leading with, I'm sorry, Raphael Warnock is currently leading 56% and Herschel Walker is behind 42%. And this is with 26% of the precincts reporting. And you going off of what you were saying about like notability and that being into what people are coming into elections. It's happening in Pennsylvania. It happened with Donald Trump. And it's something that is really going to start continuing and even with Kanye West saying he was going to run for president in 2024. These notable figures, celebrities, are running for elections, and it's it's wild how sometimes they can really get a lot of votes. Yes, and now we will be going to Colby Reese, who is at El Charo for the Republican Watch Party. Thank you, Kayla. I'm here with Sarah Hostetter as. Um, we are here at the Republican Watch Party. So what are your thoughts on the Ben Klein race? Um, well, I'm very happy. It seems like he's winning by a decent amount, and we worked really hard. I actually campaigned on, campaigned with him during his primary run and his general election. So I'm very happy that all of our work paid off, and I hope he continues the work that he's doing in Congress. And what are some of the things that Ben Klein is going to take into this room? Um, say what's going to take in taken to this election that he won? Um, I think he is going to see the mandate that he has after getting so many votes. I think he's at 71% right now and going to continue doing what he's doing. He had already been doing a very good job representing the Shenandoah Valley and I hope he just continues what he was already doing. Well, thank you so much for joining me and back to you all in the studio. Our reporter Noelle James is live at the Democratic Watch Party with more updates. Noelle? Thanks so much for joining us. We're back at Clementine's and I'm with Mr. Andy Cohen here. So how do you feel about tonight and all the results? Win or, lo win or lose, how do you feel? I'm elated. I'm glad that the campaign is over and we worked hard and I'm thrilled to have been part of a team that did this together. And some of the things that we did, we didn't even plan out. We said somebody took the responsibility for one aspect. Another took responsibility for a second. I took the responsibility for a third. And we did it as a team. Because we are all committed to the same set of values. We have different talents. Emma is a STEM. I'm a retired economist. Kristen is a mental health worker. We bring different talents, but they complement each other. 
but we all have the same fundamental value in the dignity and respect owed to every single child, every single student in the school division. And I think that if we have if the numbers come in as we believe they have, the, the city believes us and they agree with us about that important aspect of public education. Every single child, no matter what their skin color is, where they worship, if they worship, their gender identity, their able or disabled ability, whatever defines them as individuals, they're entitled to be treated with respect and dignity as individuals and be accorded the greatest education that we can provide so that they can live out their dreams. All right, thank you so much for your comments and for your time. We have, we wish you all the best in your campaign as it ends tonight. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back with some more updates later on. Back to you guys in studio. Thank you. Our reporter Sam Game has some updates on the Ohio Senate race. Sam? Thanks, Regine. In the Harrisonburg City School Board right now, there are five seats up for grabs and three people are in the lead. Andy Cohen, or there are three seats in the up for grabs, I'm so sorry about that, and five people are running right now. Andy Cohen, Kristen Laughlin, and Emma Phillips are all in the lead right now, so we are still waiting on three precincts uh, for results for that. Um, as for City Council, we have Danny Fleming and R Monica Robinson, both Democrats, still in the lead for those two House, or for for those two city council seats. So sorry about that. Um, and as for the Ohio election, we have Tim Ryan uh, currently in the lead, um, and J.D. Vance is at 40%. Tim Ryan is at 51%. Uh, we have 11%. We have 11% reporting right now, and that is all we have over here. Back to you guys at the desk. No, it's okay. I just. Parents' rights and students' rights has become a prevalent issue in the Harrisonburg School Board, specifically in regards to trans students' rights to change their name and pronouns without parents' consent. The issue remains up in the air as the board has met with a lawsuit filed by Harrisonburg teachers and students against the previous policy in which notifying parents was not required. Although, although there is a divide in the candidate's stance on the issue, they all agree inequity is, inequity is the most consequential issue in Harrisonburg schools right now and offered their individual solutions to address the problem. The Harrisonburg City School Board has three seats up for grabs in the 2022 election. Candidates include incumbents O.B. Hill, Andy Cohen, and Kristen Laughlin, along with newcomers Emma Phillips and Corinne Jackson. Cohen, Laughlin, and Phillips are running in a slate, while the trio may have different main passions. And I think it's very important that the school division, which is the largest segment of city government, be a leader in helping to save the planet. I have a better understanding of emotional and social learning, uh, the mental health and welfare of our students and staff, better than the average person. There is a gap in our STEM classes, a racial gap and a gender gap. And it's important that we address those inequities so that every student who's coming out of Harrisonburg City Schools has the skills that come along with that STEM education. They all have one thing in common the equity of all students. We have to do everything we can to protect all of our kids. Jackson, a lifelong Harrisonburg resident, believes her background in finance will help her to bridge the gap. There's unfortunately a disconnection between the school board and the community. And so it's in my heart and in my passion that we restore that trust with our parents. We restore that trust and confidence with our teachers, and we have that trust with our kids. At a public forum held last week, the candidates were asked about one of the biggest issues facing the board trans rights, specifically in regards to changing a student's preferred name and pronouns. This comes out after Governor Glenn Youngkin's new school model policy, where parents are required to be notified about a student's name or pronoun change. EAK said they didn't support it. Works in opposition to the policy that we currently have before us in HCPS, which is non-discriminatory and in favor of all of the children while Hill and Jackson do. To say we support all parents and support parents and then block information from the families. We want to be welcoming um, and we want to have that good communication and to stop and, and have that trust with our families. It's important for us to communicate. Even though Jackson and Hill are not running together, they have similar views on parental rights inside the school system. As we are helping our students, we are also helping the families. I know how important it is to provide safety for students, but that is not at the expense of not having the families involved. 
there are some people that unfortunately believe that it's okay for parents to just be blocked out of their child's care. Breeze TV was unable to obtain a personal interview with Obi Hill due to scheduling conflicts. Reporting for Breeze TV, I'm Zoe Mowry. We're now going to toss it to our reporter Sam Gain with results on the 6th District. Sam? Thank you. As for the 6th District right now, we have Cli Ben Klein in the lead running at uh, with 70% and Lewis, uh, Jennifer Lewis um, behind him with 30% of the votes. That is a very high contrast between the two. Um, we are finding that there is more backing for Ben Klein right now um, with him winning the past previous, the two past previous elections. Jennifer Lewis has run against him in 2018 and she, there was a smaller margin, but she did lose. So that's all we have for our current six district updates. Back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, Sam. That's a wide margin, Zoe. Yeah. Um, you know, Ben Klein has ran against Jennifer Lewis before, and, you know, maybe she thought she had a better chance this time, but those numbers are, are deep. Yeah, it's proven that she didn't have a better chance. So. Um, sorry, sorry, Zoe. <laughs> we will now be tossing it back over to Regine and Dr. Sofaro. Um, so on the topic of the 6th District House, so as we saw, um, Ben Klein is leading 70% to 30%. Um, uh, previously in 2018, when Jennifer Lewis ran against Klein, she uh, she lost 44% uh, to about 66%. Do you expect it to be a wider margin or a similar margin this year? Um, well, that district changed boundaries a little bit as well. So Klein gains Winchester, loses Lynchburg. Um, Honestly, I expect that probably the results will be similar. The only thing maybe that's different this time around is Democrats less likely to turn out to vote for Lewis, thinking that there's no chance in a district that got redistricted that didn't change anything. Right? This district has always been overwhelmingly Republican. In the 28 years I've lived here, a Democrats never had a shot. And so I think getting Democrats to turn out has just always been rough. But those numbers are pretty considerable. Yeah. And um, our reporter Colby Reese is live at the Republican watch party with more updates on this race. Colby? Thanks, Regine. There's a lot of happy faces here as it seems that Ben Klein is close to winning this election. With the wide margin, as Sam mentioned, many of these people are celebrating and are happy about Ben Klein winning the election. As we are here, they're still eating, celebrating, and having a great time as they seem that their candidate has gotten what they wanted throughout the night. Back to you on the studio. Thank you so much, Colby. And I wanted to go back to um, how Zoe and Kayla were talking about the popularity of newcomers in politics. We uh, saw this especially in 2016 with Donald Trump, even last year in 2021's Virginia gubernatorial election with Glenn Youngkin. And now we are seeing that uh, the same thing with uh, in Pennsylvania and Georgia with Herschel Walker and Dr. Oz. Uh, what are your thoughts on this change? I don't know that it's a change. We also had Arnold Schwarzenegger become governor after having a, a, a life in the movie industry and Reagan. So I think, I think it's been an ongoing pattern. And I think that if Elon Musk were to decide to run for president tomorrow, there would be a lot of people who would want to vote for him. So I think we've kind of gotten to the point where people imagine that if you're a famous person, then you must also be a smart person, that you must be qualified. If you can afford things, that results in other qualifications. And so political scientists call those, those kind of celebrities amateurs. And I think we'll see more people without political experience running for office, um, just because that trend has continued from the past into the present. And why do you think voters uh, tend to sway towards uh, newcomers like that? Um, I think because people find their personalities appealing and think that they know them, and people don't like the idea of politicians. And so if there's somebody who's not a politician that you respect in some other part of their life, then you might think that you can respect them as a politician as well. Politicians mm -hmm. are really disliked for some reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, many analysis, analysis are expecting a red wave tonight. Do you believe the GOP will show up in high enough, members, uh, high enough numbers to flip congressional control? I think they will in the House for sure, in part because they're, this is the year after a redistrict. So a lot of those districts are just gerrymandered and there isn't really an opportunity for them to be competitive. So I think Democrats have to defend too many House seats that are in conservative areas now that have been, that have been redistricted to, to be less competitive. I think on the Senate side, 
there are more seats for the Republicans to defend. So I think there's some chance for Democrats to hang on to their 50-50 margin. Um, but I don't think it's really gonna be possible for the Democrats to defend the House effectively. And what Senate seats are you expecting to flip tonight? Um, ones that I'm expecting to flip, oh, that's a tough one. Um, so for example, Arizona, I think that the Democratic incumbent will probably win, and Alaska, I think the Republican incumbent will probably win, but I don't know about Wisconsin, and I think that'll be a sign about Wisconsin. So I'm kind of looking at it for what it's going to tell me, right? So if a Tea Party conservative that is a Trump favorite hangs on in Wisconsin, then that means that Trump will probably be more effective in Wisconsin in the future. Similarly in Ohio, it's a very conservative state at this point. If there's any way the Democrat wins, then that's a, a sign for Ohio about the, the party's competitiveness. And I don't expect Ohio to flip. I maybe expect Pennsylvania to flip. Mm -hmm. Um, and Kayla and Zoe have more updates on our local elections. What do you guys have for us? I'd like to make a small correction um, from our reporter, Colby Reese, who I hope is enjoying his Mexican food. Ben Klein is not the official winner yet. Um, more results are still coming in. Now we'd like to toss it over to Sam Game with some breaking news on Georgia's election. Thank you. We are still waiting on one precinct to come back to us, but Monica Robinson and Danny Fleming are both Democrats and they are still in the lead for the city council, the two seats that are up for grabs on city council this year. And Emma Phillips, Kristen Laughlin, and Andy Cohen are all in the lead for the three seats up for school board this year. They are all independents. Back to you guys in the studio. We're now going to toss it to our reporter, Noelle James, who's still at Clementine's with the Democrats. What's going on out there, Noelle? Some hopeful faces down here at Clementine's as some good news has come in from unconfirmed, it's unconfirmed numbers, but some good news is looking to come in for both Danny Fleming and Monica Robinson, who seem to be in the lead, but once we have those totals will be confirmed. But um, as for now, we'll be ready to speak to Ms. Robinson and Mr. Fleming as they are here to speak with us at Clementine's. All right, hi. So um, we have received unconfirmed numbers, but it looks like you and Mr. Fleming are in the lead. How do you feel about all this? Um, again, they're unconfirmed numbers. So right now we're just going to remain calm and just wait for the official numbers to come in. But we're happy that um, the citizens of Harrisonburg turned out today and came to the polls and voted. And uh, what are some of the changes that you hope to see once everything, if, you know, wins or losses, what, what, what are some of the changes you hope to see within the council? I'm hoping that um, we will see more of an emphasis on um, citizen leadership um, and put a little bit more into making sure that we get all the diverse experts or, or the expert advice of the citizens to the table. So that's like the biggest thing that I'd like to see done. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time, Ms. Robinson. We'll be catching up with you later on as well. Thank you. Um, so you heard it here first at Clementine's. We'll be getting some more of those results as they come in, as we we'll also be hoping to speak with Mr. Danny Fleming later on. But for now, it's back to you guys in studio. The results for the Georgia Senate. With 33% of precincts reporting, Herschel Walker is at 43% and Raphael Warnick is at 55%. A great lead on, and we're going to toss it back over to Sam Game with some more results. For school board right now, we are seeing that Obi Hill has over 2,600 votes. We are seeing that Corin Jackson has over 3,400 votes, and we are seeing that Emma Phillips has over 4,900 votes. Andy Cohen is, has over 4,800 votes, and Kristen Laughlin has over 4,800 votes. So we are still seeing that Emmy, Emma Phillips, Kristen Laughlin, and Andy Cohen are in the lead. Thank you, guys. Back to you guys in the studio. That school board election, it's, it is something. Um, are you surprised by this at all? I was a little bit, um, I was at the forum that was held last week, and I, in my own head, I fully thought that possibly Corinne Jackson could get a seat. And so, actually, we're going to transition back over to city council. 
Um, 100% of the precincts are reporting, and Monica Robinson and Danny Fleming look like they're in the lead. So we're going to toss it back over to Regine at the panel. So about those um, school board uh, updates so far. So it is interesting to see that um, Andy Cohen, Kristen Laughlin, and Emma Phillips are leading, especially after this um, lawsuit against the Harrisonburg School Board and the um, Youngkin's new uh, model policy guidelines. What do you think this says about Harrisonburg voters' views on this policy and this lawsuit? Harrisonburg voters tend to be more liberal than the surrounding areas for some reason. And so um, I'm not really surprised that even though there is a lawsuit, that people still have confidence in those particular individuals to lead the city council. I mean, local elections in Harrisonburg have trended Democratic for the past couple of decades. And that just seems to be part of the bigger overall pattern. Mm -hmm. And although all candidates on the school board, uh, they are independent, um, why do you think that uh, voters are leaning towards uh, Andy Cohen, Kristen Laughlin, and Emma Phillips? Do you believe that this policy has been the decisive issue in this race? I don't think so. I mean, I think that that's part of why those candidates are doing well, um, is potentially that there are other things that voters are voting on the basis of. Andy Cohen has been on the city council for um, quite some time now. And he was responsible for spearheading some of the building of the new high school. And so a lot of parents are really excited about the new high school. So I think there are just other things in the city that people are voting on um, aside from that policy, which is more associated maybe with the new governor and outside of this county than it is associated with, with this particular area. And do you think there are any other issues that voters were thinking about when voting for school board? Um, that I'm not so sure. I mean. <laughs> The biggest issue in the past has been how much the city is paying for the new school and some of the local school taxes. And yet they've still ended up voting for kind of the same school board time and time again and committed themselves to these kind of major financial allocations. So I haven't gotten the impression the school board has been all that controversial, even on issues that have, have otherwise would otherwise make voters worry about controversy. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your insight. Our reporter Sam Game is live in the newsroom with more updates. Sam? Thank you. So while we are still waiting on that one precinct to report to us, we do have some numbers on city council. Uh, Mar Monica Robinson is currently in the lead with just over 5,000 votes. We have Danny Fleming, who is right behind her at 4,979. And then starkly behind them, we have Marshall O'Rennick and Rick Nagel. Rick Nagel actually has uh, 3,107 votes, and Marshall O'Rennick is in last with uh, 2,200 and through 2,925. Um, thank you guys. Back to the studio. So, uh, Dr. Sulfur, earlier in the show, you highlighted, highlighted how abortion has been um, incentivizing a lot of m more voters to go out to the polls. Are there any other issues that are uh, a concern for voters and a priority? Um, some states have marijuana legalization on the ballot. That tends to result in more voter turnout as well and more young voter turnout. So anytime there's a policy referendum on the ballot, that does tend to, to create more turnout. Um, and, and abortion in particular is on the ballot in a few states, but it's not on the ballot anywhere like it is on Michigan, where um, it's similar to Kansas in whether or not it's going to be enshrined as a right in the state constitution. So, um, so I expect that voter turnout, for example, in Michigan is going to be just unusually high for that reason. Right, if a conservative, if a conservative state like Kansas is able to pass um, or support a constitutional right to abortion, then I kind of expect that that will also draw voters out of Michigan. And are there any other policies that you expect to be um, affected following this year's midterms? Um, you know, that's a tough one. I mean, there are things I think that, that candidates should be talking about, like climate change and energy, but what, what candidates are talking about seems to be more the politics of the moment. So what I see the GOP talking about is Biden and whether or not the economy at the moment is what it should be under Biden or not. Um, and what Democrats are talking about are more like long-term Democratic Party goals in terms of health care or climate and kind of downplaying energy. And I you know, don't see a discussion even of long-term policies toward Ukraine. So there are things that, that to me are going to be on Congress's agenda in the future, probably right after this election. But I don't see candidates really addressing the hard issues at this point. 
And we've been highlighting a couple of battleground states tonight. And as we wrap up our coverage, what other states and races should we be looking forward to like for the rest of the night? Um, so there are some. I mean, to me, Utah is interesting only because it's a Republican versus an independent. And that independent has refused to caucus with the Republicans in the Senate if he wins. Um, and he's somebody who was formerly a member of the Republican Party. So if the independent wins, that takes away from the total number of senators voting for a Republican or a Democratic majority. Um, and so that influences the Senate. Um, what's also interesting is Alaska is a Republican versus Republican case of um, a ranked choice voting primary. And so again, that will be interesting because Lisa Murkowski, the incumbent, voted to impeach President Trump and he campaigned really heavily against her. And so whether or not she's able to survive that vote um, will tell us something about voters in Alaska mm -hmm. and how devoted they are to her in particular. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, before we wrap up, I want to update about the 6th District House uh, uh, race. About 60% of results are reported. Ben Klein is leading 68%, while Jennifer Lewis is trailing 31%. Um, as we wrap up tonight, I want to thank uh, you, Dr. Sofaro, for being such an asset to our show. And it's always a pleasure to have you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Routine. Mm -hmm. And back to Kayla and Zoe. Talk, to talk a little bit more about school board results, we've got some. We've got about 90% of precincts reporting. It's Emma Phillips in the lead with 4,960 votes, Aunt Kristen Laughlin with 4,882 4, votes, and Andy Cohen with 4,850 votes. And the three, which are EAK, have been running together and planned. They were hoping to win this election, and it is looking like they might. So Harrisonburg City School Board is at 90% for precincts reporting. Um, something that's really interesting about this is that O.B. Hill, um, Andy Cohen, and um, Kristen Laughlin all used to be a trio together. But um, they kind of broke up a little bit, and Emma um, took his place. And you know, being an incumbent, I didn't, I didn't know how this would go. Um, I figured, you know, he might have it in the bag, but. Um, it appears EAK um, did their campaigning well. Um, now to turn it over for city council results. Um, we have 90% of precincts reporting. Monica Robinson um, is in the lead with 5,116 votes. Danny Fleming is behind that with, with 4,979. And Rick Nagel with 3,107. And lastly, Marshall Arenick, which is 2,925. I'd also like to touch on Chris Jones, who ran unopposed. He actually lost the Democrat Democratic Caucus by one vote um, around that um, with Monica Robinson and Danny um, back in the primaries. Um, and yeah, Chris is un unopposed in a special election. Um, and I believe that's, that's all we have. That's it's the end of our election show, Kayla. I just wanna thank you guys for letting me come on and dip my toes into some politics this semester. It's been so, so fun getting everybody in our staff to cover politics, to be able to co cover politics with you and cover politics with Regine. I'm so immensely proud of everybody. And I'd like to say a thank you um, to our audience for being patient with us. We are a young staff and we work our butts off every day to make this the best that we can. I'd like to say thank you to our advisors who work tires, tire, tirelessly to make sure we have absolutely everything we need and all of our staff and the lovely Regine R. Nazari for making this show as special and informative as it is. Get some rest everyone, stay safe and take care of one another. I just really wanna say thank you to our advisors. I mean, we have been working tirelessly for the past two days inside this basement. Ryan Parkhurst has been in there making our graphics and everything. John Hodge is in here in the studio. So just wanna give them a special thank you because we wouldn't be here without them. Yep, and we'll see you next year on election night. Goodbye, everybody. Take care.